Good afternoon. My name is Brian Lee Crowley, and I'm the Managing Director of the Macdonald Laurier Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this MLI webinar, which is the launch event for the new book by my friend and colleague at MLI, Dr. Sean Watley. Before I turn things over to Sean and his publisher, Dean Baxendale, for more about the book and the issues that are discussed therein, I just wanted to express how important I believe it is to be able to discuss the challenges to Canada's healthcare system frankly, and to provide a platform for the best new ideas for reform. This is what the Macdonald Laurie Institute is all about. In the decades since its founding, MLI has become the leading national voice on issues as diverse as the failings of the criminal justice system, dealing with authoritarian regimes such as Russia and China, and ensuring prosperity and opportunity for Indigenous peoples. One of our favourite topics has been the management of Canada's healthcare system. For years, our research has shown that far from being a world leader in healthcare, Canada is losing out on innovations and other things due to old ways of thinking. We spend more than other modern economies and generally have poorer outcomes. But too often, when we talk about the ailing healthcare system, we have forgotten about that long-suffering stakeholder, the patient. Canadian patients deserve better, and their needs must be at the centre of this debate. The pandemic through which we are all suffering has exposed many issues with the healthcare system, including capacity, access to medicines, care for the elderly, and much more. But these problems have long been present and have been ignored for too long. With the launch of Sean's book, When Politics Comes Before Patients, and the esteemed group of panelists gathered here online, we hope to continue to make a major contribution to this vital national debate. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dean Baxendale, President and Publisher of Optimum Publishing. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists uh, for today, as well as Dr. Sean Waitley uh, for, uh, for writing this book. Uh, Sean and I started talking about this book about two years ago, and uh, it, was a, uh, it was a great opportunity to work with somebody uh, like Sean, who's such a free thinker uh, and can bring a lot of different disciplines and ideas to the table. Um, I'd like to First of all, thank MLI for their uh, unwavering support of uh, book publishing and for small publishers like myself in Canada and bringing ideas uh, and debate to the forefront. Uh, I would also like to thank the Manda Group, who's our sales agents here in Canada, who have been working tirelessly to get this book out uh, given the pandemic uh, and the issues with the distribution channels. Um, the book is available through Amazon, uh, and through Indigo, although supply may be an issue, you may well be able to get the book directly from Optimum, uh, which may be the most expedient uh, at this particular point in time. So just in terms of opening, uh, I would like to uh, actually go back a few, some years ago to a book that Optimum published. And uh, so I'd just like to set up the, the narrative for today. The Halifax meeting. Then came September. The annual meeting of provincial ministers of health was a regular event, but was something special in the air this time around. It was said that the four Atlantic provinces were planning a common front on user fees. The new leader of the Conservatives, Brian Mulroney, not yet elected to the House, had started attacking the federal plan in August and had not stopped since. Healthcare is too important to be politicized by Madame Bejan. Miss Bejan, a very nice person, but she should have her mouth washed out with soap. She is a street brawler looking for a fight. Then the conservative provincial premiers attacked with Richard Hatfield from New Brunswick in the league. Then René Levesque gave the usual Quebec response. Ottawa threats on Medicare are really a new invasion of provincial jurisdictions. The provincial premiers invited me through the media to attend the health minister's event, but they then sent an, a note to to then Prime Minister Trudeau to make sure that I was to attend. It was no fun. The constant personal references began to weigh on me and contributed to my sense of isolation. At times, I remember what I had been taught as a child. If everyone else is right, 
maybe you're wrong. This is from Monique Dejean's book that Optimum published in 1987, Canada's Right to Health. And uh, I think it sets up our discussion very nicely today. Um, in 2008, we spent $115 billion on healthcare in our country. Uh, and now 2019, we spent $264 billion with an uptick of only 13% on aggregate of our total population. Um, based on this trajectory, in provinces like New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and British Columbia, 50% of all programmed expenditures of provincial budgets will be focused on health care. Is that sustainable? It is not sustainable because it means we will be making cuts elsewhere. Now, this today's debate or our discussion is not about setting up uh, the costs and, and talking about that specifically, but it's something we should be aware of on the horizon that we have some significant issues facing us over the next 10 years and without a non-political response where we can bring people together to discuss and to debate and to bring ideas forward, I think that is our best approach. Now with that, I'd just like to introduce doc, Dr. Sean Waitley. Uh, he's a fellow, as you may well know, at the McDonald laurier Institute. Um, he's written a number of books, uh, including No More Lethal Weights, and is the former president of the OMA. Sean, thank you very much for doing this book. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean, and thank you, Brian, for your opening uh, recorded message as well. So I'm going to jump right in and read something from the introduction and so that we can get to the panel as quickly as possible. This is just the first opening paragraphs. At some point, you will likely find yourself lying in a hospital bed. There's a good chance your bed will be a firm rubber pad held between two rails and parked along a corridor in a busy emergency department. Messy hairdos will stick out from the stretchers lined up ahead of you. Moans of nurse will echo all around. But in that moment, you will feel relief, not fear. Relief and a fierce, jealous attachment. At least you have a bed. You're out of a packed waiting room and finally able to lie down. Your relief, however, will be tempered by a heightened awareness of how people treat you. Does the nurse come when she promised? Does the doctor make eye contact and treat you like you matter? When you call for help to empty your bladder, does anyone answer? When someone finally comes, will she say, you have a diaper, and walk away? Does your bed have a sheet, a blanket, a pillow? These questions are not hypothetical. Broken promises, rushed formalities, diapers and rubber mattresses all happen to real patients in Canada. Few complain or even mention these problems at first. When asked, they report details about diagnosis, tests, and treatment, but when they start talking about their experience, they all use the same word, undignified. Patients want two things, excellent medical care and great patient service. Excellent medical care means getting attention when they need it that fixes the problem they came for. It means access to the best that medicine has to offer given the current standard of practice. Great patient service means being treated like the most privileged patients in the system. Athletes, celebrities, and the friends and family of those who work inside the system. Everyone supports excellent care and great service, but as this book will show, our Medicare system cannot deliver these consistently. Some Canadians get outstanding medical care, but most get mediocre and too often poor care. Doctors and nurses try to provide more care with reduced resources. As for great care, that is an aspirational goal, something to pursue if all the other essential work has been accomplished. We need a fearless, dispassionate assessment of how socialized medicine has delivered on our initial dreams for it. Do the core ideas give patients what they need? Or does socialized medicine lead to anti-patient policies that often strip them of care and dignity? So hopefully that's uh, caused uh, enough provocation to spark a, a uh, lively discussion. Really excited to have three panelists. I'm going to introduce them to you right now. Just to be clear, 
these three could easily carry the content of the day, no trouble, but we did actually invite five panelists. Two could not attend, and both of them were women. Our first panelist is Dr. Hal Berman, or the first one I'm going to introduce, rather. Uh, he's a palliative care doc, a former federal NDP candidate, and a self-described lifelong socialist. He also happens to be perhaps the nicest guy that I know, so good luck trying to debate him. Even if you disagree with him, he will still probably win you over to his side just because he's such a nice guy. The next person is Dr. David Jacobs. Uh, Dr. Jacobs is a radiologist who works in Toronto and Northern Ontario. He's deeply involved in medical politics and, and health leadership, and he may be the toughest guy I know. Good luck getting into a fight with this gentleman. But what he will does not want you to know is that inside of him is this gigantic heart. And so if you appeal to his compassion, you will score points and you may even win the debate. Our last panelist is Pat Rich. Pat has written over the last two decades um, extensively. He's been an editor of Canada's largest medical newspaper, a publisher of, again, a major medical journal in Canada. He's a veteran medical writer. There's a very good chance that if you've been reading in healthcare over the last two decades, you probably have read something that Pat has either written or edited. So, Pat is already inside your brain. And the thing I love about Pat is he holds to this old-fashioned classical liberal idea that you can actually have a debate and disagree fiercely without hating the other person. So I love that about Pat. I've asked each of the panelists um, to go ahead and speak for about four minutes and talk about what they think of the book and uh, what they think about the topic in general. We're going to start with Pat and then go to David and then end with Hal. So Pat, David, and then Hal. So take it away, Pat. Thanks, John. I really appreciate the invitation to be here today and looking forward to the discussion as we go on here. There's just so much, you've asked us to sort of speak briefly for a few minutes, and there's just so much in this book to discuss. It's hard to know where to begin. I mean, we could basically have a whole conference on all of the issues you raise. Some of the points you make, I think, are spot on, and frankly, some of them make me cringe a little. So there's a, there's a lot in this book. And I thought since I was kicking off, I just made a couple of the fundamental points that you've made in the book that we're gonna be talking about. One is that Canada has socialized medicine, meaning all care is paired for and no questions asked. That the primary role of the healthcare system is to achieve social equity. That Canadian Medicare has been raised to a sort of iconic status that cannot be questioned. That we're using wait times and restricted access as the main means of controlling healthcare resources. The Canadians are unwilling or not being allowed to consider any funding or delivery options outside of those offered by socialized medicine. The government control has created a system which, to quote you, is inefficient, haphazard, and wasteful. And if unhampered by these controls, physicians could provide far better care for their patients and patients would be far happier. A couple of quick points on some of these things. Firstly, anytime you bring in the term socialized medicine into a debate, with respect, you're going to set up a political dichotomy. So, Sean, you're talking a, a lot about divorcing this discussion from politics. But I think here, when you bring up socialized medicine so often, it, you can't avoid politics. And anyone who agrees or disagrees with this book is probably going to do so along political lines. Uh, I would also argue, I think, that to bring you back into the mainstream here is that what you're advocating for is a quality healthcare system covered by what's known as the quadruple aim, which is a system that improves patient care experience, improves the health of the population, reduces per capita health costs while ensuring the well-being of providers. So I think a lot of the ideas you're bringing forward are you don't hear about this a lot outside of healthcare, but there are a lot of things people believe in. And I don't think the problem is politicians trying to enforce a socialist utopia that, that maybe you're implying through the healthcare system, but rather it's a system struggling with too few resources. True, a single payer system in, in Canada just can't afford to deliver the care everybody needs. 
and right now. We just can't afford to do what we're doing with the healthcare system. But I fear that any alternative we set up will be building in inequities based on the ability to pay. And on your other point about the failings of a centralized system, you make some great points. The one I really like is about data, that we really don't have the data that we need to plan healthcare delivery well. We don't have it in our EMRs. We don't have it to build the paradigms we need for AI. But then where I do take a little bit of, challenge you a little or even have a little bit of umbrage is your attack on the bureaucrats and the managers who you think are maybe divorcing doctors and patients from where they really want to get to. And I think maybe you're setting them up a bit as a straw dog for the failings in the system. Having worked within the system, I know some of these people who are, and some of them are physicians, and they're just incredibly committed to the system. I think of people like Joshua Tepper and Irfan Dalla, people I've worked with in Ontario Health. So, you know, I know there's a lot of points in the book about, about bureaucrats and managers derailing where doctors and patients want to get to, but I'm not sure that's incredibly fair. And I also think that we have to keep in mind that healthcare, the system's in a, what people call a complex adaptive system, meaning it's so complicated, it's not really gonna be easy to change. Some people talk about it as changing a, a uh, ocean liner in mid-ocean. It's, it's really slow, it's really difficult to change. So I don't think we can simplify a lot of the challenges we, we face. I could go on, but I'd like to pass it on to the other panelists for their remarks. Excellent, thank you. We have Dr. Jacobs next. Sorry, just scroll right through to the next speaker. There we go. Hi there. Um, hi, Sean. Great book. Thank you very much for writing it. And uh, I'll tell you why I'm so appreciative of your writing. Because the Medicare system in Canada has achieved a certain status where you're not allowed to criticize it. And because you can't criticize it, there's very little chance of affecting positive change. So everyone who works in the healthcare system uh, is acutely aware of its shortcomings. Uh, we deal very well with patients when they're acutely ill, uh, but we don't deal so well with most of the other patients. If you have a chronic illness, we're not so good at taking care of you. If you have an illness that might be able to wait, not so good at taking care of you. So what that comes down to is resources, resource allocation, philosophy, a lot of different moving parts, as we said. It's a very complex system. Uh, but by writing a book, you allow us to start talking about it. And really, that's what we need to do. We need to have more of a conversation. We need to take, uh, we need to step back from the puritanical view uh, that uh, socialized uh, healthcare in Canada is uh, the height of healthcare and any tinkering with it will result in complete disaster. We need to, to stop considering any criticism of the system to be heresy. It doesn't need to be a right or left uh, argument. This is an argument about patient care. This is an argument about uh, population health. Uh, and it's a, it's a conversation that is long overdue. Uh, so I thank you very much for, for writing it, and I thank you for uh, writing it in a very factual way. Not everyone's going to appreciate it, uh, but uh, I think it's an important read. Thank you. Want me to start? Yep. <laughs> so th thanks, Sean. I'm, I'm really, really honored to be a part of your panel, Sean. So I've, I've been involved in healthcare in many ways. As a political candidate, I had to study our party's healthcare policy. And so I've come up with a lot of criticisms about, about our healthcare system and why they should be changed. As an internist working in the hospital, I saw right up front some of the challenges that we face. And one of the first memories I have as an attending physician, the first month that I actually attended on medicine, was a patient who did not have any health care insurance. He was not a Canadian, who was admitted with a rare form of cancer. 
and the chemotherapy that he needed to save his life would have cost about $2,000 each time he got it every couple of weeks. But the hospital refused to allow him to come as an outpatient and get it because he didn't have health insurance. And so I, and then the doctor who took over after me, couldn't discharge him because discharging him would have meant him dying. And that would have been irresponsible of us. And it cost the hospital about $2,000 a day to keep him in the hospital. And that really highlighted for me the difficulty with bureaucracy in medicine. Now, since then, I've switched to doing home palliative care, and I see every day the challenges that people face getting the care that they need at home. And so this book and this topic is of great interest to me. Now, you'll notice that I, I read through it a lot, and I made a lot, a lot of notes. I won't bore you with all of them. Um, but I want to say that you bring up a lot of really good criticisms of our healthcare system. I agree with a lot of those criticisms as well. You might be surprised to hear. But what I disagree with is that they are because of a single payer universal healthcare system. I think that what we're looking at, and you even talk about the difference between where you use the terms socialized medicine for much of your book, but you even admit in some cases that you really should probably be calling it managerialized medicine. And I think it's in that distinction that I think we, we have the disagreement. I don't think that a single payer, single payer system is bad. I think that a system where people can't get what they need because of bureaucracy is bad. Now, one of the concerns that I have when anybody opens the sort of healthcare debate is that people are going to start bringing in a system where the wealth that you have can determine your act to your access to medicine. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns that we all have. Uh, I know that in your book, one thing that you specifically mentioned is that before public health care came in, physicians treated everybody who came regardless of their ability to pay. And that's great. But we know and we've seen time and time again that even a small user fee will act as a determin deterrent to people actually trying to access care. And so people with chronic health conditions who know that they will have to pay won't do it. They won't go and then they'll end up in hospital. It's going to cost the system even more and lead to worse outcomes, which is why I think that a single payer system is, I, is essential for our healthcare system. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, yeah, great. Looks like I'm back on the screen. Fantastic. We have enough fodder there in just those opening remarks to probably talk for, like someone said, we could do a whole conference on that. Uh, just to be clear for people who are listening, um, at the beginning of the book, uh, I do address the label socialized medicine. That used to be a sliming label, right? If you wanted to criticize something, you said, oh, it's socialized, it's whatever. Actually, socialism is back. So if you check the data on this, you look at articles. Yeah, there you go. Thumbs up from our socialist. That's fantastic. Socialism is back. So a Harris poll in just, a, I believe it was in 2019, showed that uh, over 80% of millennials and Gen Zs would prefer to have a robust single payer, universal, whatever label you use, healthcare system plus education plus, plus, plus. They love the welfare state. Over 50% of that same voting demographic would prefer to live in a socialist country. So un unlike the 1950s and 60s where saying socialized was a sliming word, that that's not the case anymore. And people actually are, are quite happy to describe our system as socialized medicine. Um, Jim Carrey on Bill Maher's uh, show just a year and a half ago said, hey, listen, we're in I, I'm come from Canada and we have socialized medicine. And he went on to describe how wonderful it is and how great it is for the citizens. So um, I haven't tried to slime people by using this word. I believe we can now use it again without being crass. And I believe the true blue socialists actually really appreciate the label. And so, uh, so uh, no apologies there for using that word. The, all of the speakers here actually brought, brought up an interesting point about funding. So I intentionally in this book avoided the funding debate as much as physically possible. As soon as you bring up funding, it becomes funding or no funding. Does the money come out of the treasury or does it come out of my pocket? Is it a visa card or is it tax funded? So that whole debate is an interesting debate to have. 
but we must have a separate debate on how the system actually functions. Do the ideas within the system lead to patient positive behaviors and policies? Or do the ideas upon which the system is based lead to anti-patient behavior? So with that in mind, uh, we have four topics we're going to try to cover. I think we might get to two or three of them. The first one is with around wait time. So uh, again, the speakers were asked to think about this ahead of time. The Canada is world famous for wait times. Bernie Sanders, actually, in his visit to Toronto just a few years ago, he said, everybody knows you guys struggle with wait times, but you're working on it. You're working on it. And, and I liked his uh, glass half full approach, right? We, we know it's bad, but we are working on it. But my question is, um, you know, what about these wait times? Why do we have them? Are they unexpected? Or is this a feature that we saw with the NHS in the 1960s and 70s where you have to ration somehow? And so Canada's chosen to ration with wait times. However, politicians don't want to use the R word and, and they go out of their way to avoid uh, having it come out of, out of their mouth. And then what sort of assumptions go into the fact that we've actually built a system that delivers wait times? In the 70s and 80s, we didn't have these wait times. We now have giant wait times. Someone made that decision. So what goes through someone's mind for them to be able to say, well, we're going to have to cut funding or we're just going to have to have wait times. So feel free to respond to those comments or to have your own comments. And we're going to go in reverse order here. Uh, so we went Pat, David, Hal. Uh, maybe we'll start off with David. Hopefully this doesn't surprise you too much there, Dr. Jacobs. We'll go Dr. Jacobs, Hal, and then Pat on the uh, comments about weights. Thanks. Okay. So um, I think the most important thing to understand is that access to a wait list is not the same as access to care. Uh, we're, we're fantastically good at putting patients on wait lists. We're not so good at caring for them. And uh, as a radiologist, uh, it, it's something that we see every day. We have to manage wait lists that can run from six months to well over a year and a half. Um, and it's problematic because we don't know what's inside every patient until we scan them. So you can be sitting on some very, very serious pathology. Uh, and I think that it's not fair to ask patients to wait for you. And then uh, after they have their study say, well, by the way, you have a malignancy. Time matters with a lot of health-related issues. If you catch a malignancy early, it can be curable. If you wait too long, it can, it, it can result in catastrophic uh, problems for the patient. So we're always trying to manage wait times, uh, and, but there's a twist, and here's the twist. The population's appetite for medical imaging and healthcare in general is insatiable. There is no end to the amount of imaging that we can do on the population. And you can see that in terms of the numbers. Our volumes have gone up year over year, every year. Why is that? It's because it's, 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 it's good. It gives you an answer. It's useful. But there does come a point where we do have to manage uh, that use of the resource, whether it be a single payer or, or uh, something closer to the US or European system. Because if left to its own, uh, medical imaging alone can consume the entire package. So we do have a real problem with weight times, uh, but we're not managing them appropriately. So I agree with David, and you'll be shocked to hear that. I agree that we have a very big problem with wait times. And, and I think that, uh, David, I'm going to speak about radiology in a second, because I think that that's, you, know, you have a role to play in that as well. So one of the problems that I find that we have in our healthcare system is that we are, our politicians are advertising a gold plated platinum system but they're trying to fund it on a bronze level credit card or funding. And you can't promise everything to everyone and not be willing to pay it. And for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, the emphasis has always been on reducing taxes, re reducing the tax burden on people, but always increasing spending. And you can't 
sustain a healthcare system unless you properly fund it. I think one of the reasons that we have a lot of wait times is because of funding. We have enough orthopedic surgeons to clear the wait list for knee and hip surgery, but they can't get OR time. Why can't they get OR time? Because it would actually cost a lot more than it costs for doctors. It costs a lot more for that OR time and provincial budgets just won't cover that. We could have ORs running 24 hours a day with nurses working and OR techs and everybody working and it would bankrupt our system very quickly unless we found a way to pay for it. One thing I have concern about when people talk about wait times, they always talk about how having a second tier like private pay to jump the queue, they always say that it would actually lower the wait time for everyone else. The problem is that if we have a limited number of doctors and a limited number of, of people involved, you can then draw away from the public system these resources. And so people do jump to the queue. The wait times, the wait list gets shorter, but the wait time on those lists gets longer. And so I don't think that a private pay system is a way to fix it. I don't think that wealth should ever determine how quickly you get access to healthcare. Now, where, where people like David have a role to play is that while the demand for certain procedures, especially radiology, goes up, I remember very well when I was working in a hospital getting MRIs and stuff, the radiologist's responsibility was to triage and to determine which of these scans were important. Well, they're all important in some way, but which of these were important to be done sooner and which ones could wait. And so for things that are not medically necessary, for, for low back pain of unclear origin where there is no concern about malignancy, maybe you do wait a little bit longer to get that MRI and the person who needs it because they might have a cord compression gets jumped to the front of the line. Uh, the problem and I'm sorry, Pat, I know you're, you're up next, but I seem to have been called out here. So. Not <laughs> called out. But part of the, so, so every single study that we do in the province, every single study for CT and MRI is given a code, one through four. And we do that for everybody. And uh, those, wait, those are assigned a certain uh, acceptable wait time. They never, ever get done within the acceptable wait time. So we do that triage absolutely everybody. Um, one of the other problems that you have there is because uh, our uh, elective number four, our elective group can wait well beyond two, three, four times beyond what the accepted wait time is. They can go from a number four to a number one in the time that they're waiting. And is it fair to that patient to have allowed their disease to progress to the point where they've gone from a treatable, curable to an untreatable, uncurable problem, whether it be a malignancy or a disc or a, or a demyelinating process. There's so many ill effects of delayed care. And I do think that it's acceptable for us to embrace the uh, Canadian Medicare system as some unassailable uh, ideal and put patients' care, health, life, the, their very essence at risk. We're, it's not acceptable for us to make that kind of decision for another individual. So, D David, you've set up an irresistible opportunity for Hal to jump back in, but I'm not going to let him. We got to let Pat go here, and then uh, hopefully we can maybe we can circle back because this is a really hot topic for sure. Pat, tell us what you think. I'm sorry, I don't want to get in the way of a good fist fight, but I want to <laughs> bring a couple of interesting points. One, the health minister's first minister's meeting last Thursday was the first time the premiers and the prime minister had met just to discuss healthcare in the last 14 to 16 years. And really interesting that the last time they met 14 or 16 years ago, it was to set up uh, a whole wait time management system or a whole a commitment that the provinces would address wait times in certain selected areas. So it's really interesting that back then, it's a really important, recognized as a fundamentally important issue that we had to address over the last decade 
and it's obvious from this discussion that we didn't get too far. I think there was a heck of a lot done in successfully measuring wait times and defining it, but we obviously haven't addressed them because to go back to one of my, the points I think is important, it's a way we've chosen as a single payer system to address the, the shortage of resources. And just very quickly, the other point was that for a decade, the Canadian Medical Association had an annual meeting called Taming of the Queue, which brought together um, frontline practitioners and academics to discuss this very issue of wait times and how we were going to solve them. And there again, they stopped doing that six years ago. I think just about the time we were really coming to a consensus and a solution on where to go with wait times. But then we were all overburdened by so many other issues and getting a sustainable system that we lost the momentum and we're back again and multiplied it you know, several thousand times by COVID as wait times being a fundamentally important issue and one that isn't serving the patients or the doctors very well. That's my point. Brilliant. Now that, that, those are fantastic comments from each of you and, and uh, Pat, I really appreciate you circling back to the, some of the work that's gone on before. I guess for our viewers, I just want to highlight the fact that in our system, and each of the speakers I think have agreed to on this point, someone has to think through the resources, someone has to triage, someone has to allocate money to say, okay, are we going to wait this long for this one, but not that long for that problem? And so the very fact that we have our single payer socialized system means that someone somewhere has to make those kinds of decisions. And it's not the patient and his or her provider doing that, doctor, nurse, whatever. And the fascinating thing, at least during my career, is that you'll have these people give these very eloquent, eloquent speeches about why you don't need X, Y, or Z CT scan, but yet when they've twisted their ankle and they show up in the emergency department, oh my gosh, the whole world stops. You know, the person doesn't even need a plain x-ray, but man, I want my CT scan right now because I need to know what's going on. And and, and you know what? They end up getting it, which is a pivot now to our next um, topic, which is privileged patients. You know, the old joke used to be, uh, you need to go into medicine so that you can get great care for yourself and your family, at least in, in Canada. We know and have known for a long time, in fact, uh, I quote a study in the book, 1998, where they looked at 800 doctors and hospital executives and asked, have you ever helped get patients preferential access. And 80% of the physicians said, yeah, you know, at some time I've had to do that. And 50% of hospital executives uh, said that as well. And this led to a, uh, a bit of legislation in Ontario being passed called the Commitment to the Future of Medicare Act 2004, where you can actually get fined right now if you're caught helping someone jump the queue. To my knowledge, I don't think anyone has been fined. I think the fines go as high as $20,000. But I guess my question for the panel is, what do we do about this? So it seems like we can't outlaw relationships. And each of you have relationships with people inside the system, outside the system. And, you know, if Hal picks up the phone and says, Sean, my, my mom's in your emergency department. Is there anything you can do? I'm going to try to do something. I, I'll go see him myself or his, his mom myself. And so this fact of relationship that it puts privilege just based on the fact that a relationship exists there is priority access there is by definition privilege built within our system what do we do about that how can we change it how can we get great access for the people who don't have those relationships so um i think we'll go in reverse order here uh, pat do you want to lead off on that and then we'll go a uh, berman and then jacobs does that sound uh good Sure. Just a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, first one being that I'd rather my physician actually went to see a fam another family physician or went to see a doctor than not. I mean, preferential or otherwise, we have real issues with physician health and well-being and a lot of documentation that <clears throat> physicians aren't getting the care they need themselves and aren't seeing uh, their own family doctors. So I think that doesn't deal with preferential patients, but I think it's an important point to be made. Another point is I'm not sure, I think what you're really saying, Sean, is that every patient should have access to the same sort of care that preference patients get. That every patient should have their doctor going to bat for them, making those calls, 
getting the care they need. It's obviously not a realistic expectation just because our doctors would be too overwhelmed to do that. But you're talking about raising raising the bar here. I don't think in our society we're ever going to get away from preference. People are always going to make those calls. People who know people are always going to be jumping the queue. What would be an interesting broader discussion, might we, I'm sure we have no time here for today, is should the NHL be able to buy enough COVID vaccine for all of their players and staff and be able to jump the, the triage that we're arranging for COVID vaccines? But I won't start us down that road. Great. I think we had Hal next. Go ahead, Hal. So, I mean, that's a really good question. You know, the, the, the political answer would be to say, you know, we treat everybody the same and nobody should be treated different. And I certainly wouldn't want my family members treated any better than anybody else. Um, but we're humans, we're not robots. And I, I know that we all have, you know, just the, by, the, by the fact that we know how to navigate the system, our family members probably have that sort of advantage or our friends have that sort of advantage. I'm sure we've all been called for advice by friends. You, if you don't know a doctor as a friend, you can't do that. Um, it's hard to say no. I do try to discourage my family from using me as a resource you know, to get care sooner. But sometimes, just because I know how to get something done, I, I do get involved. The way that I try, and I think the way many doctors try to moderate that sort of that privilege if you want to call it that is that i'm going to pick up the phone for any of my patients now i my patients are mostly relatively sick they usually need things uh relatively quickly because they're palliative patients right now um but if i have a patient i had a patient a couple of weeks ago who had a pleural effusion and had a a thoracentesis plan for a, for a drainage plan for two weeks from now and i well, I didn't pick up the phone. I used email because it, it works more quickly with doctors these days. And I, I contacted a doctor in the hospital who was the referring physician and said, can you expedite this for me because this patient needs it? Those are, I think those kinds of relationships are absolutely fine because we're advocating for our patients. We're not giving anybody a step ahead. I think it's, it's okay to do that because it actually provides better patient care. That patient got their, their relief much more quickly because we picked up the phone and did it. And so we should do that for all of our patients and we should try to do that. One of the problems that I, I, I'm concerned about though is what about those patients who don't have access to a family doctor? And how do we help them access the care that they need? A great comment. So David, you wanna say something? Yeah, so I, I think that um, we're asking the wrong question. So of course, people are going to have access. Uh, there are multiple tiers uh, of, of, of healthcare in, in Canada. You've got the donors who are able to phone the CEOs. You've got the people who work in housekeeping who are able to go up to, directly to the doctor and say, hey, my aunt or whoever needs something. So there are many, many tiers in healthcare. Personally, I try to do the right thing in the emergency room with one of my children and, a few weeks ago, and we just waited in triage. Why? Because it's the right thing to do, and it's not, and nobody was going to die. I've done the same thing with my father. Uh, so you try to do your best, but let's be realistic. We're all human, uh, and let's not pretend that there aren't multiple types of differential access to healthcare. So the most of us, but we're asking the wrong question because you can't legislate that. You can't legislate away human nature. What we have to ask ourselves is why is there a need to get preferential access to care? And the answer should be quite obvious. And we it brings us back to the first point is we wait too long for care in Canada. Now we can have a debate today as to how to resolve that, but the fact remains that we wait too long. And sometimes we don't even get the care that we need. And I'm, I'm just going to put, I just want to give you a pretty quick story. And this is a story, unfortunately, that, that I could tell many different times uh, for many different, in many different uh, situations. It is not uncommon for an elderly person to have a bleed into their brain. We see that not uncommon. The treatment for it, when you've got a subdural hematoma, is you drill a little hole in the side of the skull and you release the blood. 
it's not a horrifically complex procedure. I've even been in on those surgeries as a, as a, as a medical student. They're straightforward. We have, I have many examples where I've phoned down to an emergency with somebody with an acute subdural, and I've said, you need to get this kind of neurosurgery right away. Right away, they need to have this, this bleed drained. And the response when I phone back to see what's happened to the patient is, there are no neurosurgical beds available. How is that acceptable? How is that acceptable? at all, not just in Canada, but anywhere. This is not a complex procedure, and it would make all the difference in the world between life and death, or between severe permanent impairment and going back to where you were before. So we have problems both with access, not just with wait times, but actual access to life-saving care. Healthcare in Canada is not what people want you to believe it is. Yeah, well said, well said. And and I guess I would add to that, you know, in, in the book itself, I, I talk about uh, donors. So I was a uh, medical director and chief of a large emergency medicine program and also helped out with the hospital uh, foundation. And so many of the viewers may not realize that hospitals can't function unless they have charitable fundraising arms. And those are called uh, hospital foundations. In the larger cities, the hospital foundation budgets are often larger than the total operating budget of many hospitals outside of the larger cities. And so I would get calls all the time, Dr. Watley, Dr. Watley, Mrs. Smith is in your department right now. Her family or she herself uh, bought your cardiac monitors or they, they paid for the pillows in your department. And I knew that my proper response was either to go there myself and make sure that Mrs. Smith was in a room being seen or to call the charge nurse and say, listen, this person needs care. Another example of privileged access is the hockey players, which Pat just mentioned. Another example of privileged access is the workman's compensation patients. So I have patients who tell me, uh, in, in fact, I just had one recently, I won't say which body part was, was hurting because I don't want to identify the individual, but they said, no, no, I, I think I'd like an MRI of that. And I said, oh, wow, really? You're that confident that you can get it? Oh, no, no, I, I, I know I can get it. It was a WSIB injury. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get my MRI within the week. Um, and I said, wow, well, it, I guess it's fortunate that you hurt that body part at work because uh, certainly if it wasn't a workplace injury, you'd be looking at 10 months on the wait list just to get care. And then we've mentioned housekeeping and all the rest. So the reason I bring this up is because the issue of privileged access strikes at the heart, in my mind anyways, of one of the principles of socialized medicine, which is care regardless of ability to pay. And we don't have that. It's care based on if you have a great relationship. We also have tons of data, like literally dozens of studies showing that if you live in a poorer neighborhood or if you're not as articulate or as educated, you have a much more difficult time accessing care within the Canadian system. And we've known this for over 20 years. People living in wealthy neighborhoods have 23% more cardiac procedures post MI or post heart attack, and they wait 45% less for those procedures for that care. So how is that fair? And we and so we've lost the moral high ground as far as I'm concerned on socialized medicine when the people who are most vulnerable have the most difficult time accessing care. And so that's why I think this issue of privileged access, um, it, it, the whole purpose of the system was to ha not have privileged access. Everybody gets the same. But whenever you create a system with so little flexibility, people are motivated, incentivized to find ways around the rigid system. So now that I've dropped a bomb into the into the panel, who wants to pick that one up first? Uh, Jacobs, you're moving your finger. I'm going to challenge you on that. You said that the purpose of socialized medicine was to eliminate privileged access to care. And we've heard about equity and all of that. The purpose of socialized medicine was the exact same as the purpose of welfare. It's to make sure that those who are least able to take care of themselves, least able to pay for their care, are not lost. It's our duty as a society to care for everyone. And that's the purpose of socialized healthcare. It has morphed into something other than what it was originally meant for. So it wasn't yeah. meant to disadvantage other people 
to have access to care. Because and, remember, and, as soon as we say everything must be equal, the easiest way to make it equal is to make it equally horrible for you. But yeah, I don't think that, that the actual definition of socialized medicine is that everybody gets the same. Like, not everybody gets a steak. Not everybody gets a, you know, champagne. That's, that's not what socialism is. Socialized medicine, and we're not, because remember, communism, socialism are two different things. Socialized medicine believes that everybody should get the care that they need regardless of their ability to pay. And they should be able to access that. And I would be the first to agree that we don't have equal access. We don't have a, a single tiered system. But it's not because of socialized medicine. It's because the people who are administering this socialized medicine system aren't committed to a socialist system. That's the problem. We need people to run the system in a better way to make sure that we get access, but it still should be within the framework of a socialized system. I'm so glad you said that, Hal, because that is the right socialist answer. And and this is beautiful. And you've said it very, very well. I'm not saying I agree with you. I won't debate with you, but you said it perfectly. And I love it. Pat, do you want to jump in here? Or can we go on to uh, uh, Medicare post COVID? But go ahead, Pat. I'll go on to the next question right now. Okay, you get you get the you get the first kick at the can. We were going to talk about regulation, but we don't have time, and we're already getting some uh, questions rolling in that we'd like to discuss too. And uh, we've got about a thirty-minute uh, hard stop um, to go here. So I wanted, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Medicare post-COVID. So um, healthcare providers are heroes right now. Uh, it seems like we threw out our whole disaster planning scenarios that we had coming into it. Uh, we, we just made, made a whole bunch of new ones because COVID was so special. We've seen a massive drop in services. We've seen long-term care collapse. Certainly it has basically completely collapsed in our area. There's up to a one-year wait for emergency placement. And, and so what, what do you think is going to happen? Do we have uh, any advice, any things that, uh, to think about? And especially with respect to the principles that underlie our current system, are we going to try to just pour in a bunch more funding and have uh, um, some great central uh, planning solutions? Or are we gonna allow some innovation around the fringes and, and really treat it like a true complex adapt adaptive system, as you said, Pat, because I don't, I don't think we actually allow our system to be a complex adaptive system because we try to run it too carefully. We, we don't put incentives in there. We actually try to put levers to pull and push and put funding here and put funding there. But hopefully I've prov provoked you enough to, to come up with a juicy response. Go ahead. Well, I agree with a lot of what you were saying. I think we are going back to, it's going to be going back to throwing a lot of money at things centrally. We are going to have innovation around the fringes. I've been lucky enough to participate in some podcasts. I've been helping host around interviewing some, some physician leaders and others around Canada in the last few months about our response to COVID and where we're going. And the one, the one thing that everybody agrees that we're going to have a fundamental transformative changes in virtual care, that we're going to go to a system where using the telephone, using video, using other remote ways of accessing care is going to be embedded in our system. I know, Sean, you touched on it in your book on how um, this has come along very rapidly, but in a disorganized way. But frankly, you know, some, some physicians are now doing 70, 80% of their practice virtually in order to maintain everybody's health and safety. But there's general agreement, I think, that COVID has forced our system to, to rethink what's happening with virtual care. And we're going in directions we probably should have moved in one or two decades ago. The other point I want to make is I think it's going to take us two or three decades to climb out of this COVID hole now. I mean, it's not just COVID. If, when we take care of this pandemic, hopefully we won't have another one or two in the next decade or two. But all of those wait lists, all of those other types of care that have been ignored in the last year or people haven't been going in to see their doctors about worrisome bumps or lumps. They haven't been seeing them around maintaining their cardiac health. It's gonna put a huge burden on the system in the next few, it's gonna, in the next few months and years. And 
I really don't think anybody's suggested any answers to that. And we're a long, long way from even telling, you know, giving some direction in, to our leaders in healthcare as to where we want to go. So those are the two things I wanted to touch on. One is the, the virtual care revolution and the other, the fact that COVID is really going to cause fundamental problems with population health in the decades to come. Brilliant. Maybe uh, Hal, I could impose upon you and then David, you can uh, close out this uh, response. Well, it's certainly not an imposition. Um, I'd like to build on what Pat said. Um, I think that virtual care is probably here to stay. And I think there's a there's a big role for certain things like renewing medications, routines, follow ups and things like that are probably best done in a virtual setting. And, and if we want to look at how we can change the healthcare system to to better provide service, and again, if we're looking at it from a socialized point of view, maybe we will see fewer single private practitioners and more larger clinics where some of the space, some of the office space is used for, for inpatient visits. And then people work from home to do their virtual visits could actually save a lot of money and overhead. Um, another thing that we really need to look at is the relationship that we have between different parts of our healthcare system. So we can't go on in silos with acute care and long-term care separately. Uh, we saw in long-term care how terrible, how disastrous COVID was. And we really need to make some changes that will allow all the healthcare system to work more seamlessly to provide care for our elderly. In terms of the backlog, I think that a really, the, the, one of the simplest ways of dealing with the backlog that has been created is to add money for after hours work pay people overtime, open ORs at night, and that will help deal with the backlog. And if it works really well, and if it's really efficient, maybe we will be more flexible in the future with in increasing the amount of the hours where these things can be done. Um, I think that um, one of the issues about was the downstream effects of, of COVID. We know that a few years after SARS, and that was for a much shorter time where we had issues around closing services for a few years, after that, we saw an increase in referrals to palliative care because of late diagnosis. And I'm very worried that uh, we are going to see an increase in downstream end of advanced illness and end of life care because of some of the stuff that may have been missed because of COVID. But I'm not sure that we could have prevented it without planning far before COVID. So great points from both of you. Again, I wish I could answer them all. I, if we had a couple hours to talk, I would jump on them all. But Jacob, say something. Okay, I'll, I'll make it uh, blessedly brief. Uh, in order to be uh, some short, medium, and long-term consequences, uh, the short-term consequences we're already seeing, I see infections, rupture dependence, uh, et cetera, that uh, was delayed far too long and they come in with very severe complications. I've seen uh, malignancies that would have been cured or not, that are no longer. That's a short-term consequence. Then when we look further down the road, we've got medium-term consequences, which are cancers that should have been uh, screened for, particularly breast cancers that are going to be missed. And then when we look long-term, you, you, you see again with, with what Hal had talked about, where patients, it's the consequence of having missed all of these diagnoses. And it goes, it's not just malignancies, it's infections, it's pediatric surgeries uh, where you're missing uh, windows in terms of, uh, of the patient's growth plates fusing and whatnot. So uh, there, there are going to be quite a, a huge, huge knock on effect in COVID. Uh, in terms of where do we go and how does the system change? I'm gonna tell you right now, virtual care, yes, that would be one change that we see because it makes things easier for patients, easier for physicians. In terms of the big changes that we need, cowardice will prevail. Believe me, always rely on cowardice, political cowardice prevailing. If you want to free, if you want to deal with the backlog, you must have surgeries outside of the hospital, whether it be paid privately or by the system. Whether you want, when you want dialysis patients who are very fragile, if you want them treated in a place where you don't have the highest concentration of COVID, which would be the hospital setting, you need to have outpatient treatment for them. None of this will happen because it costs a tremendous amount of money and you get and you risk being accused of privatizing care, even if you are not, even if it's all paid for by the public dollar. 
So there are major system changes that could happen, and they won't. Yeah, great, great comments. And again, uh, some really provocative, juicy comments. That I'm, I can see Pat's leaning forward. He wants to jump in. Hal wants to jump in. I got to read a question. I want to jump in too. This is fantastic. Our, we, our time is too short. So one of the questions uh, coming in from YouTube, uh, a viewer says, asks, and, and the panel, okay, get ready. You guys listen to this. Uh, do you think that money is being misallocated into administration and bureaucracy? Sorry to use the word Pat, but that's what they said, administration and bureaucracy rather than frontline care are there ways to fix this balance of too little tooth and too much tail so on the misallocation of funds maybe i'll, I'll punt that to you pat um since you didn't like me attacking bureaucracy in the book and I, I wrote quite a bit about how much we're spending on bureaucrats and how many bureaucrats we have and how much power they have now i just to be clear i wasn't using them as a scapegoat because i did say that we should never label patients or bureaucrats or politicians or administrators as the problem with the system. But I think we also do need to have an intelligent conversation just to, to deal with how much are we actually pouring money into X, Y, and Z bucket. So do you have a comment on that, Pat, about whether or not we are misallocating into the administrative and bureaucratic side of things? Um, I'm going to say something to, to lay it up for David and you to respond that I'm not sure we are. I mean, for the last 20 years, I've worked with physicians on the front lines, not in medical politics. I've worked with a lot of medical politicians. Their number one response is, let's cut the bureaucracy, let's cut the managers, let's cut the middle managers, look at all the horrific waste that isn't going to frontline providers. And we've seen governments act on that. We've seen governments cut government bureaucracies to the bone. We've seen them cut hospital administrative staffing to the bone. And there isn't, frankly, there isn't a lot more bone left to cut in some areas in my in my view. And also, you know, I, I, everybody would love to see more, more money going to frontline providers. But I think in a complex adaptive system, you need a lot of those people there not actually delivering frontline care in order to make sure this whole system functions. If we don't have people helping plan how we deliver quality care and making sure all the parts are in the right places, the patients aren't going to get to the doctors, the doctors aren't going to get the resources to provide the care they want to do. Yeah. I know this is a popular view, so I'll just tee that one up for other people to respond to. So, so great, great, great comments. And, and it's fascinating. I'd love to circle back at some time, maybe over coffee sometime, Pat. You see complex adaptive systems, and I'm a, I'm a fan of complexity theory and chaos theory, but then at the same time, you say plan and planners. And those two are uh, chalk and cheese. They don't go together. But maybe over coffee, we'll sort that one out. Uh, Hal or David, do you have comments about misallocation? Hal wants to go. Go to Hal. So I have to tell you from the outset, I'm not a health economist. <clears throat> I can only speak from experience. Um, I don't know if there are too many too many layers of bureaucracy. I know that sometimes trying to get anything done with the lens has been an exercise in what we call pushing jello. It's really hard to get through because everybody has to get something approved by somebody else. But you yourself, Sean, say in your book that doctors are doing too much non-clinical work and that all of these these uh, not, I wouldn't say bureaucrats, but administrators are, are, have been taken away and that doctors are having to go and do things. And one of the most blatant examples right now is that we have emergency doctors who are spending hours on the phone contact tracing for positive patients because public health doesn't have the bodies to do it. And that's taking away from our ability to provide direct patient care. So I'm not sure if there's too much, maybe that's just not being spent in the right way. Great comment, David. I, I, I can speak with a wealth of experience on this. Uh, having uh, sat uh, on Cancer Care Ontario when we uh, revamped mammography, uh, peer review for health uh, quality of Ontario. I've done a lot of projects. I, I chair the IHF task force with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. So I can tell you uh, a number of things. First of all, the bureaucrats that we have are excellent. The, the top bureaucrats that we have, they're smart uh, and they do a tremendous job. The bureaucratic machine, however, is garbage. 
uh, I spent months, months revamping uh, mammography and the breast, uh, breast cancer screening in Ontario. Nothing that we did was implemented. Not a single thing. And that project is very, very expensive. Um, the other thing that we see is that there are bureaucratic uh, edicts that are dropped down. So when you look at in the emergency room, very small percentage of her time or his time is spent nursing. The majority of their time is spent charting. That's not care. So we have to look at not just the individual bureaucrats, not the individual bureaucrats, but we have to look at the end result of the work that they're doing and how it impacts physicians, nurses, and how it, and most importantly, how it impacts patient care. Yeah, uh, excellent comments, all of you. Uh, and and to pick up what Hal said a little bit earlier, he said, you know, Sean, really, it's about managerialized medicine, and that's exactly what we're talking about. I, you, we're not identifying individuals that are causing problems, but it's a steamroller that has ballooned and ballooned. Uh, my uncle was chief of staff in a small um, hospital on the uh, western end of our province in the 1970s. They had a number of inpatient beds, they had a long-term care home attached, they had a small um, a small uh, emergency department, they could even have an intubated patient there. He met with the charge nurse for about an hour once a week, that was all the administration they did, the whole thing. 25, 30 years later, he was chief of staff again, I guess they roped him back in. Long-term care was reduced to only five temporary beds, they had no eMERGE, no I, you know, step down ICU, no admitted acute patients, basically just, you know, five stable outpatient beds. They had a nurse, a nurse manager, or nursing manager rather, a nurse coordinator, nurse educator. They had the, the chief of the hospital and they all had to meet for at least a full day, a half, a half to a full day once a week just to administrate these uh, five beds. And so not to pick on anyone in particular, I think it's a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a snowball that has just grown and grown and grown and every great idea for a new plan, a new program, a new reporting structure, layers on to all the other reporting structures that are underneath. And these cost a ton of money. I've sat at provincial tables, local tables, where we're trying to allocate funds and it would curl your toenails if you heard some of the stories and I do include them in the book. So another pitch for the book there. I'm gonna read one more question and then we are going to, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dean shortly. There was a question here about, oh yes, Edward asks, what is the number one thing that the various players can do that will lead to a more cooperative approach to medical care between the federal government and the provinces? And so just in case viewers don't know, um, way back in the British North America Act, which was renamed to the, the Constitution Act in the 80s, healthcare was given to the jurisdiction of the provinces. So we live in a federation, you all know that, and each of the provinces are supposed to be their own uh, little governance unit, and the federal government is supposed to try to make nicey nice and peace across the uh, nation and to protect our citizens from external threats and that sort of thing. But healthcare lives at the provincial level. The trouble is, the federal government has this neat little thing called spending power. And so they can raise more funds than they're actually able to spend. Part of that comes from the tax rental agreement out of World War II, where the provinces said, here, pro here, federal government, you can use some of our taxing ability to raise funds for the war. And that taxing ability was never given back to the provinces. But the provinces now are expected to deliver far more than they have ability to raise funds for. The federal government can raise far more funds than they figure out, than they can figure to spend it on, mind you. Some governments find many ways to spend the federal money too. So what they do is they hang out these little baubles for the provinces and say, well, you know, if you do this, so right back in the 1940s, if you do this, we'll give you a, a health healthcare funding grant if you build the healthcare system. And then, oh, well, we'll pay 50% of your hospitals if you build hospital beds. That was the 19, in the 1950s with the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act. So 
year after year, decade after decade, the government keeps handing out these little enticements for the provinces to play along. And so that's what Edward's question is directed at. So sorry for uh, geeking out there on the health policy, and I, I could do that for another half an hour. But uh, who wants to jump into that rat's nest of federal-provincial relationships? Uh, Jacobs, you look really excited about that one. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's actually quite simple. For it to work, both parties must accept that there's a problem. They have to admit that there's a problem. And they also have to admit that they're both responsible for solving the problem. But because they can go like this, nothing gets done. And we know that uh, as I said before, healthcare has an insatiable appetite. So there's no limit to the amount of money that you can throw at it. And the solution from the federal government is you get what you get, and healthcare is your problem, so you go deal with it. Yeah. Mind yeah. you, we're all the same citizens, whether it's federal or provincial. So we need people, we need accountability, and it's yeah. lacking. Yeah, so to your point, actually, in, in Finland, when uh, their their um, government, I uh, forget the particular government, this was a few years ago, they couldn't deliver on their health care promises, and the Prime Minister of Finland stepped down. He said, you know what, we, we, can't, we can't fulfill our promises. Whereas in Canada, we make all these promises about health care, we don't fulfill them, and everybody keeps their job. So a, a little bit bizarre there, and I guess that's a cultural thing. Um, but I wonder, uh, Hal and Pat, do you have any thoughts about how to improve uh, federal and provincial relationships so to, to Edward's words are to find a more cooperative approach to medical care. Any thoughts on that, Hal or Pat? Hal, do you want to go first? Okay, sure. So I think, you know, as a physician, I, I'm looking at this from, from a sort of a biased viewpoint. I don't really care who pays for it as long as it's getting done. And I think, I think maybe, David, you probably agree i think you sort of spoke to that in not so many words we, we do want the federal government and the provincial governments to work together now i because based on my philosophy i prefer that leadership come from a strong federal source that doesn't mean that the government of canada should be saying here's what you have to do but i think part of showing leadership and i'm not saying who's doing it and who's not doing it. I'm not talking about a particular party, but part of showing leadership is getting all the players from all the provinces together and to sit down and come up with an agreement on standards of care and then a, an agreement on how that can be implemented and then provide adequate funding to the provinces to get it done, although letting the provinces use their discretion because implementation will be different depending on which you know, on regional issues. So I think that that's sort of my key is that agreements between the federal government and the provinces to agree that there is a problem before they can solve it. Yeah, brilliant. Pat, do you have any comments on there? Uh, just quickly, I think David uh, sort of touched on it. It's all about accountability. I think, frankly, the Feds need to put more money into the system, but the provinces need to commit to spending it in certain ways or reaching certain levels of, of standards of care. And of course, once you get into sort of setting national standards of care, then you're abrogating the constitution, you're stepping on the province's toes. So, you know, unless you want to go right back and revisit the British North America Act, which since we don't even want to revisit the Canada Health Act, it's unlikely we want to revisit the British North America Act and give all control over health to the, to the federal government. There is no simple answer to it. I think we've touched on it. You, we need goodwill from both sides. We need accountability and we need them to agree on the common problems and common solutions. Yeah, I love I love the call to accountability for sure. And I, I think, uh, at least for someone like yourselves who works in this space, it's kind of embarrassing that uh, other countries, you know, the prime minister will step down if they can't deliver on their provinces. Sweden will have a wait time guarantee, where if the public system can't deliver a hip replacement, send people out of country to get a hip replacement and so on like let's see some actual grit and show that when we make promises to the canadians you know the canadian voters that that we actually mean business it's interesting though too you've also raised the the issue that i i 
touch on, uh, not touch on, I deal quite a bit at length in the book, is the concept of why do we have a system? So most doctors and patients hold to what the experts call the naive clinical view. And the naive clinical view is the idea that Medicare exists so that people can get care. That's why we have Medicare, so people can get care. That's it. And that's what most doctors and patients and nurses and people who work in the system actually believe. But when you start digging into all these policy books, you know, you can see them on the shelves behind me, socialized medicine exists for a whole bunch of other reasons. And we've heard some, uh, some of the comments even just now about standards and equalization payments, rich provinces transferring money to poor provinces, talk about wealth redistribution, nation building to make sure that we're different from America so we don't get it taken over by the Americans. You know, on and on you'll hear people talk about why we need this, um, this program that we refer to as Medicare, which is a, a, co a collection of... Um, of laws and legislation but for the person on the street and certainly f I, I mean for me up until a few years ago i didn't even realize this was a debate uh, i thought medicare exists existed so that people could just go and get care without having to pull out their wallet but that's actually not some of the major reasons why medicare exists and that's a big part of why i wrote the book if we aren't explicit about why this huge massive funding program exists then it can get hijacked to achieve all sorts of other things that aren't related to medical care. Uh, and maybe that's a bit of a prov provocative comment. Any response uh, from you guys? And this will be your last response, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dean for some closing remarks. Uh, uh, Sean, I don't really have any comments on that, but just given it's my last kick at the can here, I would. I want to say what a once again, this is a book that's really a great read. And despite Sean's or along with Sean's really great knowledge and background on health policy, it is a very readable book. He quotes some fun people, but it is health policy in a way that is understandable to everybody. So however much you may agree or fundamentally disagree with Sean, to my to the points I've made before, I think it's a it's a good read and it'll make you think about where we've been and where we're going with the Canadian healthcare system. So, so I, Pat, I told you I wasn't paying you for this, right? Like, <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, David and Hal, closing remarks. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, have this important discussion, uh, and I really, again, I want to thank you for writing the book. This is a book that anybody who's involved in health policy really needs to read because it gives you the entire background from conception to where we are now uh, with regards to uh, socialized medicine in Canada. And because it's so readable and so enjoyable to read, I think anybody who has any interest in uh, healthcare in Canada should give it a look. Uh, I, I hope that this sparks a little bit of conversation with some of the decision makers. Uh, and uh, because we do need to change the system. The system is uh, not serving the population as well as people believe it to. Thank you, Sir Hal. So I also want to thank you for inviting me to, to be part of this. Um, reading the book was actually a really great experience. Um, it made me think, which is always a good thing. And it also made me sort of think that in some cases I've been very politically naive when it comes to my my position on certain things but it's also strengthened my position on other things so even if i don't agree with a lot of the conclusions that you make in the book i think it's actually a really good book to read i'm planning to go back and read your first book and i really hope that you'll have me back when it's time to discuss your third book <laughs> i'll have you back anytime you just continue being nice to me uh hal and you can disagree as much as you want as long as you're nice so thank you all for being here and again i, I know this is a huge sacrifice this is a busy busy time of year um it, it was hard to pin you guys down and to figure car carve and carve some time out of your out of your schedule um, as usual, this leads to far more questions. We may end up having to do this again at another time on something slightly different. I believe Dean was going to um, close out this time. I wanted to shout out to uh, MLI again. Thank you so much, McDonald Laurier Institute. Um, viewers don't realize that there's a whole crowd of people in the background that is making this work and they're all working hard and I won't list all their names because I will forget someone for sure. And, and then also to Dean, Dean, if you want to close it out, thank you. 
Sean, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you for participating today. I, I, again, as Sean has said, it's been great to get everybody together. I know everyone's schedule is busy. This is an important discussion, and I think we brought up some, some great conversation points and great points for debate moving forward. I think one of the, key, the three key takeaways I'd just like to address for this, uh, first of all, are, are three words, really. Uh, the system requires accountability and then transparency by politicians and then our bureaucratic structure uh, and the hospitals. And then most importantly, moving forward, cooperation. This is, you know, we, you know, we want to try to politicize this, but really health care is a right for all Canadians that needs to be del delivered effectively, efficiently, and with the proper care for patient outcomes. Uh, so with that being said, uh, hopefully there's an opportunity that we can actually get this whole panel together again and discuss some more issues perhaps in the new year. Uh, I just want to make uh, mention that the book is available. There's a special offer for a signed and numbered copy uh, from Dr. Uh, Waitley uh, on Optimum's site. Uh, so at uh, www.opibooks.com and you can get that through MLI. And once again, I'd like to thank MLI and thank you very much for everybody for being so frank, honest, and forthright in today's discussion. And thank you for your, the audience for participating and asking some super questions. So thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.